Welcome to Sky Women. I'm your host, Dr. Carolyn Moyers, a wife, mom, and board-certified OB-GYN. This is a place to educate, empower, and inspire. Join us each week as we share the power of women's stories. Real women, real stories, real inspiration. Put on your stretchy pants. Let's get going. Welcome back, Sky community, to another episode of Sky Women. You are in for a treat, and I know I say that every week, but I'm so happy to be in your ears today and to have a special guest with me, Kelly Casperson. If you don't know her, you should. So you need to pause right now and go download her book either on Audible. It's called You Are Not Broken, or you can buy it on Amazon and it'll ship to your house next day. (laughs) Also, she has a fantastic podcast that you can find on all podcast platforms by the same name, You Are Not Broken. Kelly Hasperson is a urologist in Washington, and I'm a total fangirl. I'm so excited to have her here today because I tell everybody to listen to her podcast, to buy her book. This is the book that all sexual beings need, quite frankly, Kelly. So thank you for being here today. (laughs) Thank you for having me. Yeah. I just wrote, I read enough books that I finally, I was like, I just got to write the one that like, I really want to read. Yeah, absolutely. Right. You just put it all in one place where, so what I love is that you take this biopsychosocial approach because you know, that is us as individuals. Right. And whenever we're talking about sex, we cannot discount all of the things that we were told or not told <laughs> through religion, through education or lack thereof. Right. And nobody got a great good a sex education. Yeah, no, it's yeah. horrible. We all, we got no training and we're expected to be experts. Yeah. So it's, so it's a disaster and we don't know how to talk about it. So it's just a disaster out there. Right. I was actually, I'm like doing research for, I'm giving a Ted talk in March. So I'm doing some research for it. And like there are studies showing we have less sex now than we had in the nineties. Like, and I'm like, it's an, we're, we're not getting better at sex. We're actually getting like worse at sex. <laughs> and do you think some of that has to do with our digital age and everybody's addicted to their phone? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think that's, well, I think there's just so many competing dopamine mm-hmm. means at this point. Like truthfully, my brain would l- just love haagen ice cream and the couch and like <laughs> Netflix. Like I am like super happy with that. Right, right, right. So like to compete with that, it's a big ask. Like, Look what, we, like back in the day, we didn't even have electricity. Like you literally could just like kind of go to bed and like there wasn't all this stuff. Like sex was a major part of your options. And now we have right. so many options, right? That we really, in order to like prioritize the sex life, we have to be like, I have to put down the like possibilities of everything else that's available to me in the world to focus on sex right now. Right, right. Because you really do have the world at your fingertips with our... Smart you have every, yeah, you can order whatever <laughs> food you want to come to your house. You can have any yeah. sort of media, any book you ever want to read, any movie yeah. you ever want to read is all available right now. And you have to say no to it to have sex. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's a big ask. Right. <laughs> Give me and, my right. bread of ice cream. I'm good. Right. So. And you add that you we don't really know how to talk about sex, right? So everybody's, you know, we're having sex, but we're not really talking about it. And and having those conversations with your partner are intimidating sometimes and overwhelming. And so it's easier to avoid. Totally. And, you know, we don't talk about it when it's good. Like, hey, what, what, what's great for you? Why do you why do you like having sex with me? Mm-hmm. Like, what does sex mean to you in the context of this relationship? Mm-hmm. Right. Do you, do you mm-hmm. use it to, to feel close? Do you need to feel close first before you have sex? Like we're mm-hmm. not talking about like basic one-on-one when it's good. So when it's bad and right. it will, it will get bad. Right? right. Like it's inevitable. There'll be bumps in the road. Like right. then you're really like, we didn't talk about it when it was going. Okay. Right. Now, what, now what do we do? How do you have those conversations when things maybe don't feel good or uncomfortable or you're in a different phase? Right. Cause you go through babies, postpartum, perimenopause, menopause, all that. Yeah, definitely yeah. a challenge. Totally. So I was, I, I'm a total fangirl. I show up for everything that you do, Kelly. I love this work. And I was re-listening to a portion of your book last night. And this quote by Peggy Klein, Kleinplatz, mm-hmm. um, who says, the overwhelming majority of extraordinary lovers told us that intercourse was irrelevant inconsequential and or unnecessary for optimal sexual experience. And so this is talking about in the context of desire. So I want to talk about desire real quick. 
Yeah. Desire is awesome. Desire is, desire is not awesome in like the, in the Instagram world because like it's complex, right. And it's nuanced and it's different for everybody. And that's what makes it so wonderful. But you kind of have to like explain brains to people, but like, cause people just want to like buy a supplement and pop it in their mouth, like Popeye and spinach or something of like, and I think so many other people with desire, like they just kind of sit back and like wait for the desire to blow in on the wind. Like desire is like a very passive activity that you either have mm-hmm. desire or you don't. I see mm-hmm. a lot of that. Like, well, I just don't have desire. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what are you going to do about it? And like doing something about it. What is it like, well, do you have a pill? Right. Like it's a very passive thing. When I started talking to people more and more about desire, I'm like, oh, they think it just like gets sprinkled on them like pixie dust. <laughs> Right. But there are different types of desire. And so I think that we need to talk about that. You know, we have responsive desire and we have spontaneous desire. And those individuals who are in long-term committed relationships, you know, our brain loves novelty. And they're like, I don't know. I'm just like, I just, my desire is just kind of meh, you know? Yeah. I mean, the other thing, that's right. And the other thing about desire is people think it's like, you got to go through desire to get to sex. Right. And so people won't have a sex life because they say, well, I don't have desire. And number one, you can just say like, well, I have a chapter in a book and it's just F desire, right? Like mm-hmm. just don't even deal with desire. Go have great sex. Mm-hmm. Like, great. And then that number two is that there's something called uh, responsive desire. Mm-hmm. And a lot of women's experience is there. The desire comes during the doing. Right. Or, or after the doing, mm-hmm. right? Like, oh my God, I always forget how good that was. Right. Right. Like right. Uh, so many girlfriends will say that they're like, oh yeah, it's great when I have it. Oh, like, you know, is sex good? Cause you know, when, as a doctor, you're like, is sex good when you have it? Mm-hmm. Because if it's not, then no wonder why you don't have desire. Right. Cause right. nobody right. desires bad sex. Nobody <laughs> desires bad sex. Nobody desires hitting their thumb with a hammer. Yeah. Right. Like if it hurts or if you're, if he's having an orgasm and you're not like, right. You're not desiring it. That's fine. Right. And so it's like, is it fun when you have it? And people are like, oh yeah, it's great. No, I love it when I have it. I always forget how great it is. I'm like, well, F desire then. Like go have the, go have the great sex. Have your partner yeah. remind you or just or just prioritize it to be like, yeah, yeah, I always forget how good this is. Right. So that's right. responsive desire, which is a very normal lived experience, especially for women and especially for people in long-term relationships. If you want spontaneous desire, you can increase your testosterone dose, which doesn't always work, but certainly mm-hmm. people who have higher testosterone may have more spontaneous desire, or you can get in and out of relationships every eight months. For the novelty. <laughs> for the novelty of it. And I think that's, you know, where a lot of people are like, I always fall out of love. And it's like, do you just not know that your brain like normalizes, you know, novelty and like yeah. the brain does, it's like a, you're coming down from cocaine basically is like the level of like new relationship energy. Right. Right. And then people think they fall out of love. And I'm like, is that true? Or do they just kind of love the buzz of like the, the new sponta- spontaneity? I don't know. Yeah. I'm not a relationship therapist, but I, but I think about that. I'm like, did nobody just tell them that that's like normal? Yeah, right, right. So I, that's what I remind patients of a lot. And when it comes to discussing spontaneous desire, I'm like, do you, it's like, you might not have thrown the party, but are you excited or like happy that you went? You know, yeah. that's how yeah. I kind of talk about it. And they're like, oh yeah, yeah. You know, like I'm able to achieve an orgasm. It's good. Okay, okay. So I think just having these conversations and normalizing it. And in the doctor's office, a lot of times you and I both know that many OBGYNs did not get good training and well, who got good training in sexual medicine, right? I mean, nobody. She did, nobody. nobody. So it's really hard to have these conversations because it's just like, are you sexually active? Check yes or no, right? Yeah. There's yeah. so much more to it than that. There's so much more to it than that. And it's like, so what if you're sexually active, if you don't like it, then it's actually would actually be like lowering your quality of life, right? Totally. So, and there's a, a good amount, I, I'm like, gearing up to because I'm I don't do research, but I'm like, if I was to, I'm gonna do research on how many married or long-term committed females are having like obligatory sex just to control their partner's negative behaviors, negative feelings. Yeah. I think it's an I think it's an epidemic. Yeah. And there's no research on it. No, that would be really fascinating. <laughs> yeah. It'd be super it's gonna be That'd super be interesting. Really fascinating. So let's talk about sex in perimenopause, menopause, because I feel like that is a large majority of my practice where patients, even in their late thirties, early forties are showing up and they're really miserable and they want to know, are my hormones off? And so I love your chapter on maybe it's menopause. (laughs) 
Yeah. Like, you know, I think the book's really for all ages. Like, yeah. Cause people are like, well, you know, just the menopause people. And I'm like, everybody needs to know about menopause. Mm-hmm. Like Absolutely. either you're, you're going to love somebody who's going to go through it, or you're going to be somebody who's going to go through it. Yep. And we have to change the needle or the change the current trajectory, which is like, mm-hmm. I had no idea what menopause was. Nobody like, that's how it currently is. Right. So it's like, right. I think it's completely great to have a menopause chapter in a book that should be for all genders and all ages. But um, I actually really got into menopause because of my podcast people and because of my Instagram people, mm-hmm. because they just kept asking me like, well, it was like the myth or the, or the like, well, you know, now that it's now that I pass menopause, there's no sex. Right. And I'm like, that's is just it normal? That's just the thing. Like, that's like the 11th commandment or something. And I'm like, <laughs> thou shalt have no sex life after 52. And I'm like, is it true? Like, is that true? Right. And so then I go through the the research on it and no, it's not true. Like, and, you know, Peggy Kleinplatz and her amazing sex expert people, like you should, they just get, keep getting better and better. And they say like the people who are having the greatest sex aren't in their twenties. Right. They don't know, they don't know how to communicate. They're not body confident. They don't have the maturity of the relationship to truly feel I can be myself. I can let myself go. I can truly be in the moment. Like the right. mindfulness that happens and the like ability to let everything go that happens. It's a maturity thing. You know how like marathon people, like the best marathoners are like 30, right? They're like not the 18 year olds. Right, right. There's like maturity in running that actually makes you the better runner. And like the, the ultra runners, they're like in their late 40s. Right. Mm -hmm. But point being, you get better at sex as you as you age, if you continue to have sex. Right. And so I was like, okay, well, is it true that estrogen matters at all in this? And again, the data is mixed. But the two top reasons that people in menopause stop having sex are availability of partner and menopause symptoms. And I would say, I can't help you with the first problem. (laughs) That's on you to get a partner or to have yourself yourself be the partner. Right. But like if somebody's not around, be like, hey, like you might realize Netflix and Haagen-Dazs is like awesome. And you've been Mm -hmm. waiting your whole life. So availability of partners is certainly important if you look at what, you know, what women are sexually active. But then number two is menopause symptoms. So if you're sleeping poorly, you're hot flashing, you're night sweating, you're moody, you don't like your belly because your fat distribution's off because your insulin resistance changing mm-hmm. and you're having brain fog. Right. Oh, and you're the vaginal not, dryness and itching. And the vaginal yeah. dryness. We didn't even talk about general <laughs> urinary syndrome and menopause. Like you're not wanting to have sex no. like at all, or it's painful or you want to avoid it or all these mm. things that come up. And so it's not as simple as like, just take estrogen and then you'll have great sex and great desire because mm-hmm. estrogen is not really tied into desire. Certainly it's not tied into spontaneous desire, mm-hmm. but if you help her sleep and you help her hot flashes and her vagina doesn't hurt anymore, she's going to be naturally just more interested in having sex. hundred percent. So it's a, it's a long story to be like, estrogen doesn't matter, but specifically for sex, but it does because it helps a lot of the symptoms of menopause. The, right. And that feeds into the biopsychosocial component. That's right. Yeah. So whenever I've ha- I had a patient come in this week who was like, I'm not really interested in that increased risk in cancer with my estrogen therapy. So, I mean, can we talk about other options? Well, there are many options for treating your menopausal symptoms, but what increased really risk of matters. cancer? Exactly. Exactly. Anyway, I, well, this is what I exactly. ask them. Like, well, you, well, you know, the, 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 and they'll go around about. They, they won't even tell me like their fears. Exactly. Cancer. They'll be like, my cousin had breast cancer, and I'm like, how's that relevant? And then they'll say, well, I don't want to increase my risk of breast cancer. And then I say, how much alcohol do you drink? Right. I'm like, any drop of alcohol that you drink is increasing your risk of breast cancer. If you tr- if you have a true fear of breast cancer, you will right. drink no alcohol. Right. And it just puts into perspective for people. Uh, we're scared of the wrong things. Right. Right. And that's where the data, like we scared women. Yeah. We so let's, basically let's, oppressed them. Right. By, by, by via fear. Yeah. Yeah. Let's um, break that down for individuals who may not know. Yeah. In 2002, when the Women's Health Initiative was released, there was huge publicity around this and the fact that hormone replacement therapy causes cancer and everybody came off of their hormone therapy a large majority yeah, of people about 70 percent 
About 70% of people came off their hormone therapy. And what we were told in ob residency was lowest effective dose for the shortest period of time, like end of story. That's all we were ever told. And now, you know, many years later, we're going back and looking at everything. And we know that estrogen is quite safe, very safe. If you get and breast women, cancer, yeah. And sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, you're fine. You're fine. But, Go ahead. But, but let's let's put breast cancer in the open. If you get breast cancer, because it is common. Yes. If you get breast cancer and you had been on estrogen prior to your breast cancer diagnosis, number one, it didn't cause it. Number two, you have better survival yes. because you were on hormones. If you look at the Women's Health Initiative, the women who were on estrogen had decreased risk of breast cancer. And the reason that the estrogen progesterone arm, progestin arm, had a higher increase, which then went away with the years, Mm -hmm. but had a higher increase compared to the placebo is because the placebo group, some of them had previously been on estrogen. Mm. So they decreased their risk. So you're comparing a group to a, a basically a faulty placebo group. You pull those women who had been on estrogen off of that. And then estrogen plus progestin was no greater than placebo for, for causing cancer. Right. Now, this is like, so you can understand this and I can, we went to med school, we understand studies, but like, this is a lot to explain to somebody when they're in your office and they already yeah. believe that estrogen causes cancer. Right. Right. And now and you know how cognitive bias works, right? Mm-hmm. So if you say the sky is blue and I say, no, it's not blue. And I've got great evidence for that. It actually makes you believe that the sky is blue more. Our brains actually <laughs> double down on, and they do this with, you know, all political, you know, sides and stuff like that. Yeah. Like, this is what the brain, the brain is not helping us. Right, right. It's like, if I'm the first person <laughs> to contradict your belief that estrogen causes cancer, you're going to double down on your estrogen causes cancer until you take the time. And maybe you won't because you don't care, but take the time to actually like read Estrogen Matters by Avram Blooming and Carol Travers and like read all of the studies that have come from the women's health initiative afterwards Mm -hmm. saying like, oops. And many people believe this was the single most harmful thing done to women in the last 20 years. Single most harmful thing done to women in the last 20 years was the publication of the women's health initiative. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Hormones are, are life improving for so many individuals and the data out there supports use of hormone therapy and I, this is like the message that we need to share with everyone. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's so interesting. I was thinking about this in the shower. Cause this is, this is like what I do is somebody was, <laughs> somebody was like, yeah, but I don't want any side effects. And I looked everything at that. Effects. Yeah. I looked at that person and I'm like, everything has side effects. And I was, I was thinking about this with like, let's think about blood thinners for an example, because we're doctors and we are going to compare as we're comparing hormones to other medications. Right. 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 Like, Blood thinners are really important for a lot of people. They decrease your risk of a blood clot, which leads mm-hmm. to a stroke. Like right. that's why we give blood thinners to everybody. But you know, you're a surgeon. Blood thinners can do shitty things to you, right? Mm-hmm. You fall, mm-hmm. you can get a head bleed, right? Mm-hmm. Let alone a post-op complication, let alone mm-hmm. all the issues that can come with being on blood thinners. So they're not right for everybody. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean nobody should be on blood thinners. Right. And we take that black and white thinking with hormones of like, and not everybody can have hormones. So nobody should have hormones is like, that doesn't apply to the, we treat women so much differently than how we treat other medications and hormones are a medication that can do a heck of a lot of good. I mean, it's profound, but like, you know, we've got studies showing three years increased life expectancy for people who take hormones. Right. If men, if men had the opportunity to take something that would make them live three years longer, they'd all be on it. Right. Right. It's huge. Yeah. It's, it's huge. It, it's huge. De- so, decreases your risk of colon cancer, decreases right. your risk of diabetes, right? decreases your risk of almost every single neurologic disease that you can get, which women get on a magnitude more than men. Yeah. We have great studies looking at it, you know, decreasing the risk of Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. Mm-hmm. Best drug to decrease the risk of osteoporosis. Yeah. And here we are like, but, but my cousin had breast cancer. I'm like, I'm sorry about your cousin. Really, I am. Yeah. But this is irrelevant to talking about what's best right. for your health. 100%. And that's why, you know, these books are so good and the podcasts are so good because it's if I can get a patient to get this before they come to see me, we can move so much further Yeah. than me trying to convince them that their vaginal estrogen is not going to cause a you know brain tumor. Right, right. 
So when we talk about hormone uh, therapy, hormone replacement therapy, we talked about the estrogen piece. You mentioned estrogen and progestin. I just want to clarify for those listeners that we need a progesterone. If you still have your uterus, we have to protect it against endometrial cancer. So we can't have that unopposed estrogen. You have to have the progesterone to kind of balance that out. And that can be yep. orally but yeah, IUD, love an IUD. I think it's a really good option, but I, I love, I love a progestin secreting IUD. And yeah. just for people to know, if you take unopposed estrogen, mm-hmm. you have a five to 10% increased mm-hmm. risk of uterine cancer. Yes. Yeah. We, I, we get rid of that risk by giving you a progestin. Yes. I have had multiple individuals who have come in to see me who were having their bioidentical hormones done by someone else who was not NAM certified who didn't necessarily have a medical degree, you know, who was doing some really woo-woo stuff on the side, unopposed estrogen or, I mean, unopposed estrogen, or they were doing some transdermal cream for their progestin. And Which you can buy just, on Amazon. You can buy that you, on Amazon. It's not legit, but you can buy it. It's not legit, on- right? And so they came in with severely abnormal ultrasounds. Their individual uh, lining was severely thickened. And now we're having to rule out individual cancer, you know? And so this is a, yep. a very anxiety for pr- provoking. And so the other message that I think is really important besides hormone therapy is uh, safe and it can improve your sex life is that there's also bioidentical options that are FDA approved. Well, yeah, let's just talk about bioidentical for a second. Mm-hmm. So if it's I have a whole a, marketing, if, yeah, exactly. If I have a granola bar and I put natural on it, mm-hmm. it's going to sell better. Mm-hmm. And natural means nothing in the food in in the food world. Natural means nothing. They just mm-hmm. put they just put natural on the package, and then you're like, oh, okay, we can charge more, and they'll buy more of this. Great, right? That's all bioidentical means. And there's bioidentical FDA approved products that your insurance covers. Right. Right. I mean, this myth that bioidentical is safer kind of came again from the Women's Health Initiative because they were using conjugated estrogens. They were using medroxyprogesterone acetate, and we don't tend to use them now. But once they sussed out the placebo group problem with the breast cancer, then you're like, well, maybe it doesn't actually matter what type of hormones you're on. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of people, it does make sense. Use use the stuff that's as close to your human body, but it's made in a factory. This is not like, I I don't know where they think bioidentical comes from. It's just chemicals made in a factory, (laughs) but it's it's identical to what's in a human, you know, just just like a lot of other. I like a lot of other medications that we take. Right, right. But, but know that when people market bioidentical, it's 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 natural on a granola bar, my friends. It's all it is. And FDA approved products that are safe and paid for by your insurance are bioidentical. We right. just know, like all the experts know it's a marketing fad. And so right. we we mostly, it mostly just tells me that the woman doesn't know anything about hormones. Because if you've done your research, you, you've heard the experts say what bioidentical means. Right. So it's almost like a litmus test of like, if you know bioidentical is a marketing term, you know a decent amount about hormones. Right. That's fair. That's fair. So you're learning it here, people. Now you know. <laughs> now you know. So then let's talk about adding vaginal estrogen. We've been talking about systemic hormones. So hormone levels that we're taking either, either orally or transdermally that are elevating our systemic levels, our blood levels. We'll see that increase in estrogen. However, there is still a percentage of women who need vaginal estrogen. Yeah. You mean if they're on systemic already? If they're on systemic. Yeah. Yeah. Already. Yeah. So j- that's, it gets uh, very confusing for people because vaginal estrogen is called estrogen and systemic estrogen is called estrogen. So it's very confusing to people, <laughs> but so by and large, any product or, or pharmaceutical that you put in the vagina is called low dose vaginal. I call it pelvic estrogen because yeah. I Instagram kicks me off every time I say vagina and labia. Okay. So, so now I call it pelvic estrogen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've like single-handedly rebranded the stuff, <laughs> but only to be confused by there is a product called Femring, right. which you put in your vagina, which is systemic. Correct. So like the more you know, the more you're like, it's a little nuanced, but by and large, the a year's worth of vaginal estrogen product is the equivalent of taking one oral tab of hormone replacement therapy. I mean, that puts it into perspective. It's right? nothing. But the it's vagina so loves estrogen. And so what I yes. tell patients is that collagen is to the face, which vaginal estrogen is <laughs> to your vulva and your vagina. Like it totally, just, it needs it. It thrives yeah. for it. <laughs> and, your, and your bladder loves estrogen too. Yeah. Yeah. So let's and, talk about the benefits. Yeah. So the vagina and the bladder share a wall. 
right? And so that's you, I'm like, this is a medication. You're going to put it in your vagina and your bladder is going to love it. Yeah. Because as a urologist, I see a lot of the genital urinary syndrome of menopause, GSM, used to be labeled vaginal atrophy. They hated the term atrophy. And it also didn't explain like why it was happening and where it was happening. So like it's a rebranding. But I see a lot of like urinary urgency, frequency, burning when I urinate. I keep going to the doctors. They keep giving me antibiotics. This keeps happening. Your urine cultures may or may not be positive. You need vaginal estrogen. (laughs) <laughs> vaginal estrogen is over the counter in the UK now. And I think that's important for people to hear Wow! again, because they think like, oh, but is it safe? And I'm like, you realize what a medication has to do to get over the counter? <laughs> like this stuff has to be safe. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the UK, it's fascinating because they're like, we just have to save a lot more money. Like we're spending a lot of money having people it coming in to like get vaginal estrogen. And this is so safe. Let's just make it over the counter. So it's a, it's a financial decision for them. That's really amazing. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? Um, but yeah, but and just the fact that we can get it on Amazon now. I mean, people have to set up their pharmacy. No, the Amazon pharmacy. The Amazon pharmacy yeah. is just amazing. Yeah. It's 20, $28 Amazon pharmacy. I want to say it's like 25 something. I mean, it's, it's fairly inexpensive. Yeah. It's cheaper, it's cheaper where you are. Fantastic. Yes. So let's talk about the how vaginal estrogen is going to help our sexual response as well. Because if we're getting more blood flow to the clitoris, we are likely to have a better experience, right? And I think it's also important that whenever individuals are getting an exam, that we're actually looking at the clitoris and the clitoral hood. Um, That's something that, you know, I'm doing the genitopelvic pain course with um, Ishwish, the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health. Such a good course. Shout out to Ishwish. It's such a great course. And it has really changed how I do all of my pelvic exams because I start with a Q-tip and I am looking at the labia majora, the labia minora. Is that clitoral hood free? There is so much that I'm seeing now that I'm like, you know what? And we were just passing by like it was, you know, yeah, the well, we drive they, between they, here in Colorado. Yeah, the urologist, <laughs> the urologist joke, we're like the gynecologist, like this is just the curtains on the way to the main stage. Yes, which exactly. Is, which is the cervix. <laughs> exactly. But for a urologist, like this is just, you know, scrotum penis tissue, right? right. Like there's, right. there's the same structures. So we're already like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a penis and a man and it's a scrotum and yeah, blah, blah, blah. So it's, yeah, v- very common for me to see a lady, she's got symptoms, pain with sex, decreased orgasm. I do an exam and she's been told by several doctors that she's air, air quotes normal down there. Yep. And doctors really do not get to even gynecologists, but do, family practice docs in general do not get taught what vaginal atrophy looks like, what right. lab, labial resorption. I didn't know this. Like yes. probably four years ago, I was like, oh, the labia minora go away with low estrogen. I just thought some people were born without them. <laughs> Right. I didn't, learn, I didn't learn that in med school or residency. <laughs> I, know. Like, I go to a freaking Ishwish conference and I'm like, that's why all these 70 year olds don't have any labias. Yeah. Which is a, it's a sexual organ, my friends. It's blood flow, it's responsiveness, it's erectile tissue. It is hormone sensitive, hormone responsive. Mm. So when your estrogen and testosterone go down in menopause, you can see atrophy, clitoral atrophy, labial atrophy, vaginal yeah. atrophy. Yeah. And get adhesion. So, giving back that vaginal estrogen is key. I say it keeps your vagina young. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the big, the big question, I, I don't know who's going to do this study, but the big question is, you know, Western medicine so good at fixing what's broken. Yeah. We're not so great at preventative health. Yeah. What's the role of starting your vaginal estrogen cream once a week when you hit 50, when you hit 45? Yeah. What's, what's the role of that? I don't know, but I can tell you that me and all my friends are we don't want to get to the atrophy point no. before we start our vaginal estrogen. No. And it, I think of it like sunscreen. Agree. Like, are, are you going to wait till you get a sunburn to be like, I should really take care of my skin? Yeah. Or is prevention a better I think option? prevention is the best medicine. And I am putting patients on vaginal estrogen younger and younger. <laughs> well, the, with the way it's getting, I mean, it's getting cheaper and cheaper. Yeah. So it's not a huge, like the cost is not a, a huge barrier to entry right. as much anymore. So... Yeah. That's, that's well, nice. I remember, you know, 12 or years ago or so, I can't remember the time frame, but whenever my mother was going through menopause, I remember the cost of estrogen being a huge deal for her. This product's been out since the 1970s, at least, yeah. if not earlier. It's an absolute crime that it's expensive. Mm-hmm. It, should be, it should be $4 as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> right. Like a lot really? of antibiotics. 
Yeah, totally. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if they do this anymore, but do you remember for a couple of years, this is pre pandemic where you could get like all your generic prescriptions for $4 at Walmart. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it went away. I haven't heard about it in a while now, but um, I'm like, this should be $4. Yeah. So your famous phrase is stop shitting all over your sex life. And I love how you end the chapter on menopause and say stop shitting all over menopause. <laughs> we have all these expectations or things that we didn't know, or we did know, you want to speak to that? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's just another way of oppressing women, right? Like we tell them what they should do. We tell them it's natural. So they shouldn't do anything. I breeze through it and I didn't have any problems. So like, yeah. what's your problem? What's your problem? Like mm-hmm. we talk about it, like, it's like, and we're all Toyotas and we're, this is exactly what it's supposed to be like. <laughs> and if your experience is weird, then you're broken. And like, you should, or you should not use hormones, these strong opinions. And it's like, we just cannot deal. And there's data on this, like because of the social media age and like how short our attention spans are, we have right. trouble dealing with nuance, you know? And it's like, women should all over each other with menopause all the time. Like oh, you shouldn't, yeah. you shouldn't take hormones. You sh- you shouldn't, you should, it's, it's just natural. I had a patient the other day. She's, she was miserable. She had, she lost her muscles, mm-hmm. massive hot flashes, mm-hmm. crazy moodiness. So she goes on hormones from some other provider, not me. And she's pretty happy on the hormones. Like she's feeling good mm-hmm. and she's beating herself up because she's on hormones. Oh, she, like she's yeah. failed because she's taking hormones. Yeah. So she's miserable. She was miserable, but now she's miserable because she, she wishes that she could just be, uh, she, she's like, I just wish this could be natural. Yeah. Well, and childbirth like, is natural, but yeah. I still have my epidural. Oh, I know. I, I tell her like breaking and falling your hip is natural. We don't just tell those women, like, this is natural. Just suck it out. We're not going to help you. Yeah. Like it's insane. I'm like dry eyes are natural. You know how horrible dry eyes are? Yeah. Horrible. But you know what is unfortunate is that even in the medical profession, patients are being told, oh, you're too young. Oh, it's all in your head. Oh, if you go on hormones now, you're just going to delay. I mean, you're going to go through menopause when you have to come off of them. Yeah. Like, you yeah. know, and so th- there's a lot of misinformation that's just being perpetuated out there. And, and women are desperate for good quality care. Yeah. I mean, I, my, one of my priv- one of my privileges that I have that I I see and acknowledge is that I take care of men mm-hmm. and gynecologists don't take care of men. Correct. I see how we treat men. We don't treat women the way we treat men. And so to me, this is a very big gender equality thing. Like uh-huh. I don't take a 45 year old guy with low testosterone who's gaining weight, who has no energy, you know, has no sex drive, whatever. Yeah. He's got, yeah. he's got, he has low hormones, mm-hmm. right? Men get, men have low hormones too. Mm-hmm. We don't take that 45 year old guy and be like, well, it's natural, you know, like, have you tried some acupuncture? <laughs> we never say that to him. Yeah. We say hormones are an option. There's risks and yeah. benefits. Do you want to try it and see how you do and check back in with me? Yeah. That's how we should treat all humans. Mm-hmm. So to me, I'm like, I have the immense privilege. And maybe that's why I've gotten to be this successful and vocal is because I'm, I see how we treat the dudes and it's right. not fair. Right. Yeah. So it's like, I, I just want us to be all treated the same. So Give everybody think, the options. I agree completely. And I think that that's one of the wonderful things about your book. The fact that you're just telling us how sex works for men, right? Because <laughs> again, back to that sex education that none of us got, you know, and so I'm telling my patients that this is a great book for you and your partner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've had a lot of couples read it together. Like mm-hmm. my favorite is like, I had a couple, she read it, she gave it to him. He loved it. And then they gave it to their older, almost adult, like 17 year old child. To read. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I won. <laughs> like the whole family read the book. I'm like second to the Bible now. This is amazing. <laughs> Kelly Gasperson moving on up. <laughs> I know it's so good, but yeah, like the men don't know anything more about female bodies than us. You know, we give away a lot of our power. Like, well, he never, he never gives me an orgasm. Like that's his job. You know, it's like all these myths of like, do you think he knows how the clitoris works? He doesn't even have one. He can't even practice. Like you're just being, stop being unfair. Right, right, right. And if you practice, you might actually know what feels good and be able to direct him. (laughs) Yeah, totally. So there's, I mean, there's so much like, you know, getting back to this, this woman who was beating herself up about her hormones. And I'm like, like, you can just decide to not live in fear, Mm -hmm. you know, like you just, and education is a way to do it. 
like the more you learn, the more you're like, I got this. I can do hard things. Like I I can figure out my taxes and how to get my oil changed and like all these hard (laughs) things we can do. Right. That's right. Figure it out. out. Yeah. I can figure out how to get a passport. Like that's, that's technical. Like we can figure out hard things. We can figure, we just need some good resources. We need people to treat us equally. Yeah. And uh, we need to try some stuff and see what works and, and be okay with something not working. Because that's the thing about menopause is like, you might need a different dose. Your dose might need to be adjusted. You know, all of these things. It might need a different formulation of of hormone therapy. I mean, there's just, there's a lot of options. So you don't have to just be like, oh, this didn't work and throw it out. I had one patient that we worked together for three to four months before we got her to her happy spot. And my favorite thing was, and she said, I feel like I've come back home to myself. (laughs) My work is done, (laughs) but it was a lot of trial and error. It was a lot of trial and error. Like, but it, so that's why I always say it's a relationship. You know, it's not a one and done. This is going to be a back and forth conversation with your provider. So women, if you are listening today and you're like, where can I get this book? Again, Amazon, you can go listen to Kelly's um, podcast. You are not broken for free. It is so incredibly good. I recommend it for everyone. If you are getting the runaround with your provider, please look at the North American Menopause Society website and find a provider in your area who is NAM certified, who can help you to sort all this out because you are not alone and you are not broken. You're not broken. Stop shooting all over your (laughs) menopause. Your menopause and your sex life. Go have great sex. (laughs) Thanks for joining us today, Kelly. Thanks for having me. All right, Sky community. Thank you for listening to another episode. This episode was sponsored by Sky Women's Health. As a reminder, we're in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and we help relieve back pain and pelvic pain in pregnancy and beyond. If you are pregnant and having pain and you feel like you have no reliable way to relieve it, look us up at skywomenshealth.com, request an appointment, and we'll call to get you scheduled. As a board-certified ob with a Neuromusculoskeletal Medicine Fellowship, I help you realign with hands-on drug-free treatment and relieve pain on the spot without medication. We'll help you maintain these results through your pregnancy and postpartum period. Every pregnant person deserves this, and we are so excited to serve you. You can find us on our website, as mentioned, or on social at Sky Women's Health, or you can call the office at 817-915-9803. That's it for today. Until next week, be well.